Welcome to Writers in Conversation. This is a series of talks uh, by writers who uh, come to Southampton and uh, interview, usually by the person on my left, Carol Burns. But tonight, the role has changed and she has become our interviewee. Uh, Carol is the author of a new book of short stories, the Missing Woman and Other Stories, which is on sale at the, st uh, at the stall over there. Um, and uh, it's my role, Peter, I'm Peter Middleton, by the way, to uh, interview Carol. I'll do what I can, but I realize that I'm up against an expert. Um, so, the short story I think, is a, is a genre that in the UK has been something of a second-class citizen in the world of literature. The uh, short story has often seemed to be somewhat neglected in academic studies, and uh, I think it's fair to say that it's, it's not been the primary uh, area that people work in. Um, I remember Ramesh Gunasekara, who was a writer in residence here, had published a book of short stories as his first book, which was very well received. And I asked him about it, and he said, yeah, terrible mistake. I didn't realize we were supposed to write novels. Um, but in fact, the short story deserves attention in its own right. It's a, it's a wonderful form. Some of the finest uh, modern writers in uh, uh, the English language have been short story writers. So, uh, Catherine Mansfield, for example, is, a, I think, one of our finest writers, and, and perhaps sometimes slightly shut, shut, you know, pushed aside because she's a short story writer. Uh, Doris Lessing, who people normally think of as a novelist, actually is, again, one of our great short story writers. It's a, it's a genre I very much love. It's subtle, it's verbally rich, it's capable of hinting at entire lifetimes, and yet concentrated sometimes into a single extended instant of time. I think that the short story has always been much better recognized in America. We might want to talk about that in a minute. Um, and it's, I thought, a very good sign that Alice Munro was awarded the Nobel Prize for uh, Literature, a writer who has only ever written short stories. Carol, I think, is a very fine short story writer indeed. She writes stories about characters about whom it would be hard to be neutral. I think one of, for me, one of the striking features of her stories is that you get really invested in the characters. You think, she can't be right, or, or I really hope things turn out for her, or uh, why is he behaving in this way? What, what's the matter with him? You, you become very invested in them. I think sometimes they're stories that almost might be narratives that you present to an analyst stories that draw you into intense questioning of behavior, motives, and, and the choices made by the characters. So there's a story called Other Women, and there's a character called May, and she's having an affair with uh, her best friend's husband, and, and we become really fascinated but exasperated with her as well. Why is she doing this? Why is she behaving this way? In another story, The City of Brotherly Something, a quite wonderful title, I think. The City of Brotherly Something. Do you know where that is? Anybody know? <laughs> Philadelphia, yeah. The City of Brotherly Something, the missing noun hidden by that evasive word something, points readers to the theme of whether certain actions and choices are signs of love. The character Tree, or Teresa, her inability to decide whether she loves her ex-lover, David, and whether he still loves her, points us to the mystery of her father's remarriage. Is it for love or companionship or out of grief or for some other reason. And it makes us readers think hard about all these characters and their doings. It seems to me, Carol, you really like to present dilemmas to readers and invite them to reflect on what's happening and why. Could you perhaps just reflect on this aspect of the fictions you write? Um, and I know that you're uh, keen to read us a story as well. I remember, um was on my interview panel and I was um, hired here and he said some things like that about my story and I said, oh, can you just keep talking? I don't want to answer that question. I just want to have Peter keep talking about my stories. Um, 
Anyways, thank you, Peter. That was a lovely introduction. I, I, hmm, I, I don't exactly know how to answer this, this question. It, I, I just think, um, I suppose there are situations that interest me, and hopefully the, the characters, um, they come out of the characters as opposed to just like some sort of plot twist. And when I think about um, writers who are influential to what I wanted to do, um, even though I don't necessarily want to write sentences like Henry James, the way he traces um, a woman's especially consciousness is something I was really interested in, is something I suppose I aspire to. And if, um, in a way, if that's coming through with, um, in, in the way you s spoke about it, it seems like that's coming through a, a bit in terms of their um, consciousness and, and their dilemmas and their choices. So I, I know that you've been thinking of reading um, uh, The Missing Woman, um, and that seems to me a story rich in the, these, these dilemmas. Could you perhaps introduce it to us? No, I'm just going to read it. Okay. <laughs> Jill felt the baby breathing sleep into her arms as she watched the mechanic hoist her bicycle onto a lift. The gears were noisy, shifting before she did. The mechanic turned her wheels to listen, quick, click, click, clicks like a stream over rocks, heard the gears shift, shifted them himself. He reached behind him without looking to grasp a wrench with his right hand, tossed it lightly to his left as if it were a girl on his arm, then stepped forward to stop the spinning wheel with the palm of his hand. All of it, Jill, the bike, baby Trina, the shop, suspended by his gentle motion. Hey, what's wrong with it? Her husband strode into the shop holding their daughter April's hand. She was silent as she walked, thumb in her mouth, still not fully awake after falling asleep in the car. He had on his Saturday voice, the voice Jill hoped to hear when she woke in the morning, cheery, friendly, open to the day. His job as a prosecutor had been snapped shut in his briefcase or maybe tossed in the shed where Michael kept his tools. Jill didn't care where, as long as he disappeared. Just needs a little adjustment, said the mechanic, maybe also the shop owner. He was thin, tall and thin with grainy blonde hair, so sandy it was nearly gray, no sheen at all. He had that proprietary air about him, comfortable among the bikes and the tools he seemed to find by feel. It was Michael who'd wanted Bill's bike tweaked on their way to Georgetown to ride the canal trail. Though she was anxious to get on the trail, she had indulged him. She liked the idea of stopping in DuPont Circle for a quick tune-up the way they used to on weekend mornings before the girls were born, with just themselves and their bikes and maybe a bottle of water. It's an old bike, Jill said apologetically. Though its body still gleamed blue, its silver gears were mottled black in places even rusty. Michael had been after her for years to get a new one. It's a beaut, the man said. Parts all made of metal, not plastic. Bikes are lighter these days, but cheaper too. She raised her eyebrow at Michael, gave him a little, ha. Huh. He swung April's hand into one of his, then the other. His body was thick and softly muscular, almost plush. He was barely taller than Jill. Their gazes were completely even. You think you've won now, don't you? He said lightly, the southern accent that reemerged sporadically when he was sleepy, when he was home in Atlanta, coming through. You hitting the trails? The mechanic pulled the chains loose from the gears. In his hand, the metal links looked elastic. We're going to drive down to Georgetown, take off from there. She described the route, taking the Capitol Crescent Trail until it intersected with the canal, following the dirt towpath as long as they dared with the girls in tow. Michael used to prefer the paved efficiency of the Capitol Crescent, had liked getting lunch at one of the restaurants where it ended in downtown Bethesda. Now he had decided the canal trail was wider, flatter, less crowded, and therefore safer for the kids. Jill took this small gift gladly. She liked looking left to the river, right towards the canal, as if she were floating between two bodies of water. I have a favorite spot, she said, shifting Trina carefully to her other shoulder. The baby squirmed but didn't wake. Near lock seven. I go there in the mornings when Michael can watch the kids, when I'm able to rasp myself out of bed early enough. I've seen black crowned night herons there, green herons, and of course, blues. Michael pulled April to his leg, 
cupped his hand on the side of her head and stood straight and alert. I know that spot, the mechanic said. It's near Little Falls. It's right. Do you go? I've always wanted to get there at dawn. Haven't made it yet. They chattered on about roots, favorite mini trails that went down to the river where Jill would get off her bike, walk through the trees and brush and to sit and watch the water. As the bike guy went in back to get a part, Jill grazed her cheek on Trina's baby hair, her warm head. She closed her eyes and remembered the last time she'd been able to get out at dawn before Michael went to work, the feeling of weightlessness as she took off on her own, of danger even, as she slipped through Michael's overprotective worry. It was probably two months ago now. It had been only the second or third warm day of spring. She gazed around the shop and found Michael staring at her with snap black eyes. You shouldn't spill your life out to strangers, he said. She stood still, held Trina, tried not to wake her. She whispered fiercely, Michael, freaking giving him your minute by minute itinerary? He lifted April to his hip, but she wriggled down. He kept hold of her hand as she tried to escape to run around the shop. He just shouldn't. Everyone uses those trails. He's not an axe murderer. The mechanic returned as Trina was beginning to fuss herself awake. Jill wrapped her arms around her and swayed in place. The world, she thought, wasn't a crime scene. But she kept quiet. Maybe she had been talking too much because the bike mechanic didn't speak either. He stepped to the front of the bike, spun the wheel, lifted the chain off, reached back for a tool, listening, concentrating only on his work. Jill knew from his fluid movements that he'd be a good dancer. His touch was light yet attentive, his lead just that, a lead, not a push, so light you felt you were leading, the same way he let the bike lead while guiding it, just the same. He was probably gay, a thin dancing bike mechanic in DuPont Circle, so Jill let herself imagine dancing with him, his hand on her waist, his movements graceful. She could almost feel him guiding her as she held her baby daughter close, her husband, dark, stocky, by her side. So the next section is Michael's. And um, they leave the bike shop, they go down and set up all the various equipment they have <clears throat> for this, um, what used to be a sim simple bike trip. So, um, so uh, Michael will be, they start off at the end of the scene. Um, Michael's in front, is that right? Listen, I can't remember. Um, so um, Michael's towing both girls and Jill's in back, and so he likes that because then everyone's in, in sight. And anyways, um, one of the, the only thing you really know, need to know from this section is Jill has a nickname for all these things that they do, and they, they call this entire like car and bike seat and everything, she calls it the Royal Entourage. <clears throat> now they're on the bike trail. Ahead, two women wearing pants and jean jackets, as if it were cold out, were halting people on the trail. A younger woman, long black hair slipping forward in greeting, held out a friendly hand when she approached people. The other, older, with silvery blonde hair, stood back. This stuck out as incongruous. Political petition, Jill thought, here on the trail? Some people whizzed by on their bikes without slowing down. Even from a distance, it looked rude and Jill resolved at least to stop and hear what they wanted. I'm sorry to bother you. The younger woman carrying flyers smiled an apology. Her face was pale as winter. We're looking for our friend. She's been missing since Tuesday. Since Tuesday? Jill counted the days as she and Michael stood astride their bikes. She'd been missing for five days. The woman's sing-song voice nearly lulled the menace right out of what she was saying. Was her friend even alive? Why haven't they read about this in the paper? The woman continued. We think she might have been here, here on the trail. Why do you think she was here? Michael asked, sharp. Her car was found in the neighborhood back there. She motioned behind her, right near the trail. You think maybe she parked and taken a walk, but she hesitated for the first time. We don't really know. The friend handed them a flyer with the woman's photo. She'd been caught by surprise a smile just beginning to appear, blonde hair loose around her face. She looked pretty in a casual sort of way. So were you here on the trail Tuesday morning? The first woman asked. Have you seen anything? No, Michael answered for them. We mainly come on weekends. Jill used to come in the mornings. 
You made it sound like past tense. Was she a jogger? Did she take morning walks? Mommy, mommy! April started chanting from her trailer. Honey, shush. Not really. The woman's voice sounded matter of fact, a forced practice calm as if she'd been doing this her whole life. Jill wondered when it would hit them, how many separate times it would hit them that their friend was missing. Mommy, 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 faster and louder. Michael was in prosecutor mode, gentle with his soft accent but firm. Where exactly was her car? Were her keys in it? Did she know anyone in the area? Do you think she could have gotten the ride-on bus to the metro? Jill used to like this Michael. He used to make her feel safe, like he'd get all the information they needed. Today, she just wished he'd back down. The woman on the flyer stared back at Jill, her eyebrow raised as if in a challenge. She looked bemused, as if all of this, as if life, was slightly funny. Jill tried to figure out if she'd seen her on the trail on the few days she was able to get out on her own. Would she remember her? She might be more likely to recall someone's golden retriever, a limpy jog, before her face or hair. Did she take walks in the morning, Michael asked. Were you sure she was here on the trail? Listen. The second woman, shorter, stepped forward and spoke for the first time. She was wiry, intensely athletic. Someone who, rest is gone, might go hiking the trail. Listen, I'm her sister, and I don't even know, so thanks for stopping. No one said anything as the sister stood, hand on her hip, ready to move on. It was as if the missing woman herself had shown up to plead her case. Jill looked at the photo for a resemblance and recognized the woman's demanding gaze. Good luck, Jill said as she found her voice. I wish we'd seen her, that we'd been here. Michael turned to grab his handlebars, but Jill remained still. Ahead on the trail, she saw that strong vines growing from the canal had already tentacled onto the dirt towpath. The woods across the canal, the swampy undergrowth between the trail and the river, the trail itself, all seemed vast and impenetrable. How would they ever find her? Then the river and the canal, which should have made the search seem easier, limiting the land to a thin strip, themselves became menacing, as if they could swallow up all of them, let alone one woman missing for five days. Yeah, good luck, Michael added. Can we help? Jill asked. It popped out of her mouth as she thought of how quick the growth would get as the summer went on. Did the sister know? By July, it would feel like a jungle. Mommy, mommy, mommy. She could sense Michael stiffen, though he released his handlebars, smiled pleasantly. I mean, can we help you look for her? Jill asked. Do you have enough people looking? The women hesitated. The young one glanced at Trina and April. Sure, but the sister finished. You've got a full boat today. Michael stuck out his hand, wished them luck again and ended the conversation without seeming as if he'd cut anything short, though Jill knew he had. He had cut her short from volunteering the whole family, from turning their bike ride into a search for a woman they didn't know. She thought about saying something as the women walked away, but didn't. You really shouldn't be biking this alone, he said, his foot on his pedal. April was quiet as she sensed they were setting off again. You don't even know she was on the trail, Jill said. He took off. She looked back at the women halting two walkers, answering questions, although they didn't have much information to share, didn't know why their friend and sister was missing, what she'd been doing, where she'd been. <coughs> was she a jogger? I'm sorry, good luck. Jill got on her bike and caught up to Michael, Trina, April, the royal entourage. She didn't look back again to see. Michael felt himself riding faster than normal. He slowed down, then began thinking again of the woman. Missing for five days already? She didn't stand a chance, and knew his legs were pumping faster again. April's cart rattled loudly over a small pothole. Would Jill really have stopped to help? Did she realize this is what he did every day? Help people determine what happened to husbands, brothers, sisters who were killed, abused? Did she? I forgot to mention that Michael is a prosecutor in Washington, D.C. I should have mentioned that. Um, yesterday, he had watched the faces of the grand juror listen in their objective juror mask to the testimony of a five-year-old boy. His kid voice lilting high and summery in that dark chamber meant for adults, describing what the man had done to him when his mother wasn't home. 
naming parts of a body a boy shouldn't know the names of, describing acts a boy shouldn't have even imagined yet. One juror held his hand over his eyes as if the boy's words were a light too harsh for the man to bear, so he hid his eyes because he couldn't block his ears. It was a victory for Michael. The grand jury was so convinced they'd upped the charge to the more serious offense he had argued for that he'd been told to back off from by his boss. A good day at the office. He'd watched the faces of the jurors not used to what he had heard a thousand times already from this boy, from others. Maybe that's what scared him, knowing too much, being inured to it, not trusting himself to be careful enough, so he was too careful. He found Jill in his rearview mirror. She was nearly anonymous under her bike helmet and sunglasses, but still feminine with her slim arms, her tight breasts a little larger since she was still nursing. He wished there was a way to make her look more like a man when she was out here riding by herself. Her long hair, already back in a ponytail, could be pinned up. She could wear a looser shirt because she looked so female despite her slim tomboy frame. He'd buy her an iPhone for Christmas, though she didn't want one, didn't want any more gadgets. It's disgusting how many gadgets Americans buy that they don't need, she'd say. No, not for Christmas. He'd just upgrade to the next version and give her his iPhone. Justify it that way. Turn on that app that lets you locate the phone when it's lost. He'd always be able to find her. Michael, wait. Jill braked, skidding on the sand. He stopped gently and turned toward her without getting off his bike. What was the problem? Trina gurgled behind him as if the mere sight of his face gave her joy. Michael, I want to help them. Can't we help them? He heard himself sigh. He tried to sound patient, reasonable. Jill, we've got two kids here, sweetie. We're already behind schedule. The girls are going to be hungry pretty soon. His reason sounded stupid and selfish. He felt stupid and selfish, but he didn't want to stop. He didn't think it was a responsible thing to do. Besides, the search was pointless, a necessary gesture, but largely pointless. He tried to say the next part gently. Honey, their friend, her sister, probably isn't alive. It's been five days. Was he the only one who realized this? How can we not help them? We're not doing anything. He wondered what the woman's friends thought they were accomplishing. He could see they weren't doing a good job. They should be bunched together, shoulder to shoulder, meticulously searching each square inch for clues, an earring, a button, instead of spreading out into groups of two or three as if they'd been scattered by the wind. They would need another 50 people to make a difference. Two more people, Jill, aren't going to help. She was being impractical. She always was impractical, charmingly impractical, but she couldn't do that anymore, and he was getting angry. She couldn't have her bike breaking down when they had two kids to get home. They couldn't drop their plans and join a search party with the girls in tow, could they? She had to be more sensible. At the least, the kids would get hungry, tired, let alone upset if, God forbid, they found something. Jill would get upset. They would sense the atmosphere. Hell, he didn't want to be the one beating back the thick brush off the trail to discover underneath the lush green fern a woman's dead body. Honey, what if we find something? Do you want April seeing that, living with that, Jill? Jill felt bombarded by Michael's logic, as if each fact was a little stone he was tossing at her bike helmet. He was right, but he wasn't right. How could they not stop? We used to help, she said. She threw that at him, that maybe just a few years ago they would have stopped and helped. Jill would have. On her own, she would have done it without thinking. She used to carry Michael along on these impulses of hers. He'd join her as if they were doing something crazy, bungee jumping, parachuting. He'd step up with a sense of adventure. We didn't have any kids, hon. We have more than ourselves to worry about now. Jill thought about the girls and their hunger and felt her right breast, the one Trina preferred, suddenly full, brimming. It spilled wet into the cup of her nursing bra, but she'd just eaten. Trina should be fine. She'll be fine, Jill said. They'll be. A biker raced toward them. He whizzed by in a flash of yellow nylon, black helmet, tanned arms, legs pedaling so fast they were almost spiraling. 
and then he was gone. She smelled his sweat, subtle and strange. She didn't know what to make of them. The men like machines on their bikes, the women walking, the couples jogging with their happy dogs, all of them oblivious to the missing woman and Jill and her daughters who were bound to be hungry or tired or frightened. Oh, Michael, she said. She heard his kickstand clink against a rock and his sneakers on the dirt as he walked toward her. Her bike was still under her as he hugged her, almost tipping them. It's frightening, isn't it? He kissed her forehead like he would one of the kids. It's horrible. She wanted to believe it, but she was crying over a woman she didn't know. You come here by yourself? It's frightening. She felt her tears wetting his shirt. Do you want to go look for her? We can look for her. The kids won't know. I'm sorry. She glanced up at him and saw that he meant it. She knew he didn't want to stop and search, even now. Most people wouldn't think of stopping. Most women with two children and a husband they didn't see enough anymore wouldn't even consider bringing two children when those kids were just about ready to eat on a search party. The idea itself was an extravagance. Jill felt herself relent. No, it's okay. The kids, she said. You sure, he asked. She could hear the relief in his voice, but he said it kindly. He meant it. April howled. The sound was dulled by the nylon cover of her wagon, but still loud. Jill ran over to her. It didn't sound like a hurt scream, and peered inside. A scared scream? April's face was already red as if she'd been crying for hours, not seconds, her cheeks completely wet. Honey, come here. What is it, sweetie? April crawled out of the wagon to be held, soothed. Michael patted her head as Jill held her. They walked over to Trina, a preemptive strike. She looked worried, or maybe just curious. Jill was still amazed that one didn't always set off the other. April quieted in her arms. What was that? Michael asked tempting fate. They couldn't assume her crying fit was over. Maybe tired, hungry? Jill asked her daughter, but April couldn't say. She wasn't old enough yet to put words to whatever was making her cry. Jill wondered if anyone was. They gave both their girls apple juice and graham crackers and prepared to set off again. I wonder if she just wanted to be moving, she said. They laughed at the idea, their imperious toddler demanding the royal entourage get rolling again. Ahead of her, April and Trina seemed content. Their heads turned one way, then another, as joggers and rollerbladers and bicyclists sped at them and passed them. She could see the red shadow of April inside her wagon, her back completely <coughs> straight. Ever since she could sit up, April had held herself erect like a dancer. On the river, a crew team rounded markers for a practice run. A pair of kayaks, one yellow, one red, glided downstream. In rhythm, their paddles flashed in the sun. Michael's bell ching-chinged as he passed a pair of walkers. A muscle twitched under his nylon shirt. He held his back straight, barely turning to look at the river or the canal, interested only in going forward. As she followed him, she wondered for a moment if he still loved her. As he pedaled swiftly on, relieved to be going again, relieved her fit of willfulness was over, she felt this piece of him resisting her, steel-like, unyielding. Of course he loved her. She knew he did, but she didn't know it the way she used to, in a wave of knowing that stayed within her, never left, but kept gently insisting as if she'd always known. Now she knew with her head. Of course he loved her, first with her head, before she could feel it in her heart. She also knew she'd regret not stopping, all day and all night and all weekend and years later, if she thought of it, she'd regret not stopping to help search for the missing woman. She wondered if her regret over not stopping would make her stop the next time. And she knew it wouldn't, and her regret turned inward as she wondered what was missing, why she wouldn't be able to stop, why the kids and Michael and the fear of not being able to keep her family whole made her unable to follow her instinct to reach out. Thank you. Carol, that was wonderful. What um, I, I particularly notice in that story and in a number of others is, is that um, you're very interested in those moments when 
um, that, that we shift from the, the, the heart to the head or the, 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 the embodied self to some more abstracted idea of who, who we are. Um, there, there are several moments in that story. I, I was struck by um, another story where the, the, you um, have a character who's kissing on, uh, on a, or thinking about kissing on a first date, and she says, it's little like landing in a foreign country, which is, I thought, a wonderful uh, uh, sort of comparison. But you're very interested in these moments of visceral, intimate embarrassment, or moments when, when the self, the embodied self, intrudes on consciousness. Um, I, I wonder if you could say a bit more about this. It's, it seemed a very, very powerful part of your writing to me. Um, I suppose to me it's, um, I suppose it's <laughs> a reflection of inner conflict with the character, where um, often you have an instinct to do something, or you want to do something, and, and then your head stops you. And, and I also think that there's often a, we, um, we, we, can, we can just feel things instinctually in a way that our head can rationalize them away. And, um, and it, with the title um, of The Missing Woman, I mean, The Missing Woman wasn't the first story I wrote. And it wasn't either um, the title of the collection. Um, it was one of the later stories I wrote. And when I wrote it, obviously, the title of that story would be The Missing Woman. And I thought, oh, this is a perfect title for um, the collection, because the women are either literally missing, like this, this woman who's disappeared from a bike trail, or a mother who's in rehab, or, um, or they're metaphorically missing some piece of themselves. So, um, and that, that has to do with the conflict of something they're not listening to in themselves, I think. I do a funny story that um, when I was in Washington, D.C., and um, was having a it's okay. Um, and explain to somebody this idea. I, I, at the time, hadn't used the word metaphorical. I said that, you know, as a woman are literally missing or, or missing a piece of themselves. And the man said, like an arm? <laughs> <laughs> so I always use the word metaphorically now and there. <laughs> now, you mentioned Washington. Um, um, I, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about your background and how you came into writing. You, you worked as a journalist, didn't you, at one yes. time? Um, could, could you, <laughs> did, did working, do you think working in journalism has led you in, into writing or helped you in your writing in any way? Oh, I think it was a stop along the path. <laughs> I mean, I, I always wanted to write, but I didn't have the moxie to just go and do it. And I also knew I needed some kind of way of earning money. And so when I was an undergraduate, um, like a lot of my students, I had an English degree. I studied English, but I took the creative writing um, class module here and there. And, um, you know, and I, I loved those. But I knew I had to get a job, so I volunteered for the student newspaper. And then I sort of fell in love with journalism itself, and that was um, after my BA. That's what I did for six years full time. Uh, but there's a moment when my... Um, partner at the time was, um, you know, the New York Times, as you guys probably know, is on Sunday is about that big, and there's about 80 <coughs> sections. And um, he was pulling all the news sections, and I was pulling the book review section. And, and I thought, wait a minute, this is what I want to be doing. And so then I started taking graduate classes, and then I enrolled in a, the MFA program at Columbia. I, I, I see. Because um, I, I always think of journalism as a great training in in, in several uh, aspects of fiction writing that are vital, the, the, above all being a good observer, being, being able to notice what's happening and then find words for it, um, but, but also sort of thinking, thinking through, if you like, the evidence for, for the story. <laughs> what, what kind of journalism are you doing, if I might ask? Oh, I was very much, um, in those early years, a, a local um, news reporter working for you know, medium-sized newspapers in, in Connecticut which is where I grew up. And um, at one point, we joked, I had the 4-H beat. It was health, humanities, um, human services, and holiness. <laughs> we covered religion. Um, and then I covered education. And, um, and then after I went to graduate school, I started freelancing for right. the New York Times. And I was covering sort of statewide Connecticut issues. So I was really much a news, very much a news reporter, but also loved writing feature stories. <laughs> 
And um, so that was probably a, a way of being a little bit creative. Yeah, I, I feel in the story that you read to us that, that I, I can see the journalist somewhere in the background, the, the, right. the portrait of the, of the prosecutor. There's, there's something that one of the characters uh, uh, says, and I'm going to forget which, uh, oh, it's a long division, I think. But uh -huh. they, there's, there's, a, there's a character who, I, as I, as I um, read the story, is sort of obsessively worries over the lost moments of a life, you know, that nothing must be lost, everything must be remembered and recorded and, and sort of almost relivable. Um, and, and I wondered, it just intrigued me, it's just an insight, because you, your story is ambivalent about that, but that must be something else that you've thought about as a writer. Well, I suppose the story I just read has a, a lost moment of what would have happened if um, Jill could have sent Michael on with the kids, really, and stopped herself. I mean, there, there's a lost moment there, and if some, I mean, she talks about it, it, that it will haunt her in some way. Yes, that, that's, uh, that, that's sort of uh, powerful. I, I think uh, in a moment I'll ask our audience uh, for questions. Um, I, I guess I've got sort of if I, if I may, I'll uh, just uh, ask uh, uh, <clears throat> one more. Uh, oh, actually, I, I want to ask you a, 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 a couple of questions, actually. One was just, um, the, the, in the story that God who was whispered, who was himself whispered in her ear, you have a portrait of a, a storyteller, a, a professional storyteller. And uh, it's a, it's a, I highly recommend this story. It, it sort of folds in on itself. So there's a story within a story, almost within a story. Um, but have you ever done that? Have you ever been tempted to be a, a storyteller? <laughs> no. No, I'm really not uh, at all like that. And the way, um, but I have a friend who is a storyteller. And in fact, I stole his story. That is my friend, you know, telling his story. The rest, of course, isn't true. But, um, but you know, I, I, and he was fine with that because storytellers feel that's what stories are there. You know, you, you use it in the way that you want to use it and they make a story their own. And so I, I definitely adopted that 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 story. So that they, you they told. yes. They, so they, the, the the story is recirculating, as it were. It feels like a, a folk tale, sort of rubbed Dance. down by retelling and retelling. Yeah. Um, but but I, I think it was your mention of what I was going to ask you before I, I recalled that was was something about your your endings. Um, short stories are notoriously tricky to end, I think. Closure in a short story, I and mean, how do you finish it? Sure, the story gets going, um, but notoriously, uh, writers find that stories get away from them, and you know, what was supposed to be a short, story, a short, short story becomes a novella or even a, a, a novel. Um, I particularly like the way you, you end the, the story, uh, My Life in Dog Years, which is a great title in, in itself. <laughs> but, but could you tell us something about how you think about endings? in stories? <laughs> um, I think they sort of find themselves. I, I'm not really sure that I um, can plan it. I, I don't write in order. Um, my early drafts, even on, on a novel, is um, I write in longhand, usually, um, completely out of order. I often don't even know I'm working on a story yet. <coughs> And so, um, and when I have enough in my longhand notebook to sort of allow myself to put it on the computer, that's when I begin to shape it and order it and sort of figure out what it's about. And um, so whether that ending is in that notebook or, or it comes later, I think really depends on, depends on the story. I'm trying to think if there's any story where I knew the ending when I started. And I don't think so. Um, you had mentioned that my life in dog years seemed to end very, sort of naturally in a surprise. I think it was a surprise to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, I mean, the, reading the story, you have a sense of astonishment almost that, that you share with the the, the, the protagonist as she she's done this seemingly crazy thing of bringing a dead dog home from the vet where she works, and and so at some point she wakes up to the fact that she's never confronts her family, yeah. and they totally surprise her. Yes, and um, again, this wasn't a, a student today asked me how, how you go about putting symbols in your story, and I said, you, we, you can't really try to do a symbol, because then it ends up 
feeling like a symbol, you know, like the kind that you crash together. Um, but anyways, what I liked about that ending is um, while it's about uh, ostensibly about the dog, she's worrying throughout this whole story about whether her family will support her um, going, trying to become a veterinarian. And while the story doesn't say that, and I don't even know for sure if they do, um, the point is that they're behind her and, and they, they get her. And that seems almost more important. Yeah, it, 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 and, and we, we, you, you don't, it's a wonderful example of, of um, showing and not telling. We, we, as a reader, you, you, you think, oh goodness, they do care for her, despite her, 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 her doubts and concerns. I, I guess the other ending that, that really, really quite uh, stunned me was the ending of a story called Changing Color, a very painful experience of losing a child uh, 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 to a cop death. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and it just ends with the pr protagonist out in, sitting in the garden looking at these tulips which have been a sort of motif in the story and she just says, these are the things I wanted to teach you. Tulips, grass, red, yellow, the sun sets, the moon is full, I am here. And, and that's, that struck me as a wonderful ending and again totally unexpected. Thank you. <laughs> that story started as a personal essay about growing tulips um, and at some point I was at, um, I created for myself a little um, writing residency in Provincetown, Massachusetts, which if any of you know is at the very, very tip of Cape Cod and I was working on my um, thesis for my MFA, which is um, like a dissertation, in fact um, the MFA was 150 pages, the dis dissertation, so it was really more like a PhD. And anyway, so I'd taken myself off for three weeks in Provincetown in January, and um, there was an open mic. And I um, looked at this little essay, and I thought about write writing, and I thought, no, 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 this isn't any good, but I thought, there's something here that, that I should save. So I took the tulip part of the essay and then created this story out of it. Um, but I think the ending came as part of the story that wasn't part of the essay. Right, no, no, that, that feels very integral. It feels like the only uh, resolution that we, it, it feels the right resolution and it brings in the reader and the absent child and the tulips and we don't know which is which. Well, I, I'm sure there are questions uh, that you're, you're wanting to ask Carol. So let's open this up to uh, the audience then. Do I have any questions for Carol? Uh, I just want to ask you whether, you know, whether you feel that you know, you're, when you're writing about America or revisiting your stories about America, whether things all seem slightly different now or whether it's a, a slightly other experience than it might have been, and maybe even a more creative experience. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that um, the story that is um, God, who was herself, himself whispered in her ear, is the only story that's set in the UK. And there's one other flash, well, no, there's one little flash fiction sort of set in London, but really it could be anywhere. And then there's the story about the mathematician who's, that's set in France, and they're both English. Yeah. But um, otherwise, all my stories are set in America, as is the novel that's going around to publishers right now, as in the novel I started this summer. Um, so it, it, it's odd, I know I was, uh, Margo Livesey is a Scottish writer who lives in America and um, she said it was a big deal for her when a segment of her novel was set in America, like her work is still set here. So it's interesting, I think though that the current novel at least, I think I see America with a, a bit more distance that's extremely useful. Um, the only thing I worry about is do I still know what it's like to live in America? Um, because part of the novel set about 25 years ago, and part of it set in the Obama era, and I've never lived in America in the Obama era. So, um, but it does feel like that's still what I want to write about. Do you think you, you might write a Welsh novel one day? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty happy I've written a Welsh story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to just leave it at that for now. <laughs> It does have rugby in it. It even at one point mentioned a specific player who was uh, maybe been one of the reasons we lost the yes yesterday or Saturday. 
which is a, a big a moment of mourning in Wales. Anyway. Yes. Um, you, it rather carries on from what Julian said. Uh, you use dialogue very effectively in stories, but do you feel, now that you're living in this country or in, uh, in Wales, uh, part of the time, <laughs> that do you still feel tuned in to the sound of American voices? Or do you feel that it, it's not really an issue? Um, do Americans still sound the way you remember? I think so. I mean, I have to be a little bit careful of not inserting something like, there aren't that many British words I've completely adopted, but lose one of them, mobile is one of them. Um, I still call what you stick luggage in your car a trunk. I don't really call it a boot. Um, so there's a lot of Americanism that's sort of kept. I suppose that's one of the aspects of being a little worried about writing um, in contemporary America. Yeah. 20 years ago, I know what people sounded like, but now I hope, I hope I'm, I'm right. Yeah. Um, I'm interested to see that some of your stories are sort of inspired by um, your um, reactions to works of art. Um, so I'm just wondering yeah. how that sort of comes about, really, that it's like, um, you know, it's when you see the work of art straight away or it comes about over time and sort of reflecting on it or that sort of thing. Or... It, it actually came out of a project that um, I do with my um, partner guy, Paul Edwards, who's a painter. And um, um, some of you may know um, Callum Kerr. At the, I started this project when I was still at the University of Winchester, and at the time so was Callum Kerr, and he started National Flash Fiction Day. He's now the writer in residence at the Winchester School of Art. Um, but anyways, um, he, his first ever National Flash Fiction Day, all his events were around here. And, and I thought, oh, maybe I should do something in Cardiff. And of course, I was thinking at the same time, Carol, no, write. Like, why are you going to spend time doing another project? You should be spending that time writing. But then um, Paul and I thought of the idea of somehow um, joining um, painting and images and words in this project is something we're always interested in. So we started it. And so he gathered the first time eight painters, and I gathered eight writers, including myself. And then the the artists, rather, not just painters, sent images to the writers. They all sort of chose, like a, they had them send me their list of top three they'd want to write about. Then they had a month to write a piece of flash fiction. And then we had an event on Flash Fiction Day in which the images were projected and the writers read their work. And we've now done that five times, I think, and I've taken part three times, which is where those stories came from. I, I sort of love how, um, you know, the stories wouldn't exist if I hadn't done this project. And there's also another 20 stories that wouldn't exist if we hadn't done that project. So this really, um, it, was, it was really fun and very gratifying. Yes. Um, do you find like when you start to write a collection of <coughs> stories that you have a theme in mind or is it just that like a theme emerges now or, some, or is there a theme at all in your work? Yeah, I, I think for me it just emerges. As I said, The Missing Woman was one of the later stories that I read and yet it seemed like the perfect title um, that it fit all the stories really well. So I think the theme for me is subconscious rather than conscious. And I've never sat down to write a story. Oh, I need another story for the missing woman. It just doesn't work that way for me. Yes. Yeah, you might remember me from uh, your module last year. I right? most certainly do. Yeah. No, um, <laughs> I was actually wondering, like, um, in your current set of short stories, were there any, like, on a similar note to uh, your module of Rip Steel, were there any writers you feel that you uh, stole from in that, or uh, like? You know? Hmm. Um. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. I wanted to ask her that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't think there's any that were really specifically modeled on a particular short story by somebody else. Um, although I do think my, um, maybe a, a style or maybe a, an attention to detail is something that I value in other writers, so that's something that I'm looking at. And the, the new novel I'm writing, hopefully, it's a novel, um, I am actually quite 
studiously thinking about The Great Gatsby when I write it. In part, I want it to be shorter. In part, it's the narrator, somebody who's a step away from the action. Um, and so that's and so that's something that um, and, and also it's so beautifully plotted. So that that's something I'm a little bit more consciously looking at than I have, I think, with any of the stories. But how did you sort of um, come to the short story? I mean, is that through reading particular writers, or is there? Have you? Have, I mean, are there particular writers or many writers or? How does, how does it I mean, I think the short story um, is, is just so much easier to deal with in workshop that I think graduate school creative writing programs maybe are increasing the number of short stories being written and being read uh, because it's really hard to critique a novel in workshop. You, know, you can critique the first chapter and then if you're lucky enough to be with somebody in the next workshop, maybe the second chapter, maybe the third, but to critique an entire novel in workshop is really difficult. So, um, and I suppose you, you do, a writer does probably mistakenly think of the short story as where you start, just because it's a little bit, it, it's much shorter. It's not really any easier, but you can see all of it in, in one go in a way that is very difficult to see a novel in one go. I mean, I, I've, often put up the first page of each chapter of each section of a novel on the wall, like tape them up all around me. It's just like to try to get like a sense of it all at once. Um, but it's, so the short story is easier to sort of get the whole of it, to see the whole of it all at once. I mean, I tend to think that there's many more outlets for short stories in, in America, from mm. the New Yorker on down. There, there's a tradition of publishing uh, short stories in literary magazines. There's a lot of university magazines like Raritan or I, I want to try Kenyan Review or something that, that have traditionally published short stories and I'm not sure there's anything quite comparable in this country to that. Yeah, the Warwick Review does that. There's Ambit. Okay. Um, there, there's, there's a few here, but you're absolutely correct. There's not nearly as, as many, even proportionately, as there are in the States. And it is a really great um, venue for new writers. And I'm looking at all my students in the audience, <laughs> BA and MA. Um, I mean, and even a really small, I was the fiction editor of a really small journal for a while called Two Rivers Review, and I used to get dozens and dozens of submissions for just one slot. So it's competitive, but, but the outlets are there, and it is, um, it's really wonderful when something's accepted, too. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I, I'm sure. Um, I'm really interested in the process of how people write. Can you refer to a bit? I think you said that you don't necessarily do it chronologically. Is that what you said? And you talked about putting the sort of. I was just wondering. Um, so I'm quite. Um, I work with children, and we talk about how writers can write just write. Um, do you tend to set aside time? How how long? Sorry, these are practical things, but how long would it take from, you know, having the idea to um, <coughs> producing the final? Yeah, it really depends. Um, but um, the missing woman, I, I wrote pretty quickly for me in about a month. I had a really good draft, and that's really quick for me. Um, and it was, um, well, I mentioned it was inspired by, of, uh, unfortunately, the, um, by a colleague when I was um, working in Washington who did disappear. So I was in the search party um, that this couple runs into. And um, I had no plans to write about this. I don't think I could have written about it directly because it was horrible. Um, but I ended up writing about it somewhat indirectly. But I think that's why that story came about so quickly as well. It was really something I, I had, really had to deal with, grapple with in some way. Um, and the um, God who was himself who whispered, the God who was himself whispered in her ear came pretty quickly as well. But other stories like the city for a brotherly something, that was in gestation for ages, for years. Like I'd have a draft and I think I needed to, you know, I just wasn't happy with it. And it really wasn't until the, you know, I, was, I wasn't even going to include it in the collection. 
and I sent it to my editor and thought, you like this? And she did. So, so then I worked on it a bit more and tried to intensify it a bit. So it, it just varies from story to story. In terms of, so you were saying, um, as Christian asked, you were talking about writing inspired by art, and with the missing woman, it's writing inspired by women in the actual life. How often is that? So that inspiration comes from almost vaguely something from an actual life. Do you find you often sort of autobiographically write in a disconnected way, or are you more often writing completely fiction? Um, well, it's, it's all fiction, but. Um, some of the stuff, like like the um, the missing woman, was more autobiographical. Well, it was inspired by something autobiographical, but the main story of that isn't. And then um, things like the there's a story on his daughter, um, and w which is um, in part about a father trying to deal with an anorexic daughter and try to sort of talk her through. Um, wanting to live. And that was a, a bit inspired by um, a school superintendent I knew. He just mentioned one or two things about his daughter and mentioned that she was anorexic. And so, I mean, but I knew very little and just sort of was, but it was interested in that whole idea. And then all sorts of stuff for that story I made up as well. So, so I suppose it's not surprising that some tiny little anecdote I'll hear will will um, sort of just get me thinking and writing. Um, often, when I don't know what I'm writing yet, I'll often go out with my notebooks somewhere so I'm not distracted by email and everything. And, you know, when I don't know what I'm writing, I'll just write. And so I might write a paragraph about something that somebody told me, and then I write something else that I remember. And then it just spawns other ideas and other <coughs> descriptions. And at some point I think, oh wait, this might be a story. I think you always have to write what you don't know as well, even if you start with what you do know. Um, in my Off the Page book, there's this marvelous quote from the really great writer Stuart Dybeck, who says, I write what I know so I can write what I don't know. So you sort of maybe start in some place and then like push yourself into another place. You couldn't only, I don't think, write what you know. Um, at least I don't think I could. I'd get bored. I'm glad you mentioned it off the page. Um, yeah, just t tell everybody a little about that that project and, and, and how, how that came about. Yeah, well, <laughs> I was part of my journalistic career before I moved here was I was working for WashingtonPost.com as an online news producer. And on a slow news day on a Saturday, um, the woman who ran the online discussion section, which were interviews with people that were online and members of the audience could send a question in and the producer would sort of field those questions and send them to the guest and the guest would answer them and they'd go out together live. Anyway, we were just chit-chatting and she said some, I said, oh, I know, noticed you had this author on the other day. She goes, oh yeah, we never really get authors on that much anymore. We don't really have time. And I said, really? Would you want? author interviews, more of those, and she said, yeah, that'd be fun. I was like, well, I could do something. So it sort of started that way. And at first, when I was still employed with them, I did this once a week. And, um, and then for a year, I did it every other week. Um, and it ended up, I had 43 interviews. And at some point at a writer conference, somebody said, that would make a great book. And I thought, oh my god, she's right. And, um, and then I began to pursue that. Sounds wonderful. So you were sort of able to think, well, who would I like to talk to this week? Uh, it was about so great. It was also, um, yeah, I mean, and you would base it on whether somebody had a book coming out. That's when authors are the most accessible. And so I still remember the moment when um, I called Martin Amos's publicist in America, because he was coming out with Yellow Dog at the time. And um, I said, would he be interested? And all of a sudden, he was. And, she, and she, I said, well, you know, sometimes people, often people would be on the phone so they wouldn't have to come into the office and I would type like a frantic maniac their answers as they dictated to them to me on the phone, send them out live, it'd be live for like one hour. 
But anyways, I said, well, he can either go by the phone or we can do it by email if he wishes, etc. And I said, oh, he's terrible with technology. I'll just have him come into the office when he's in town. I'm like, oh, okay, that'll be all right. <laughs> sure, I can manage that. And I was secretly quite excited. And he was um, unbelievably gracious, I have to say. But I've seen him since, and he wasn't maybe quite so gracious. He likes to provoke, doesn't he? But um, he went up in the elevator. People were you know, coming up to him and asking to sign the book. And he was just incredibly gracious. And I have to say, when he answered questions, incredibly intelligent. He quoted two Philip Larkin poems from Hart. Wow. OK. Yeah. That's, 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 that's impressive. Now, we're, we're coming towards the end of our, our time today. Are there, are there any more questions you'd like to send in to the answer? <laughs> I'm just curious to know if any of your um, short story ideas as, they, as you start to work on them, whether you feel, actually, I want this to be a novel, I want it to be something longer than a short story. Um, so far, it's been clear to me whether something's a novel or a story, which is good, because I know one writer who said his first novel, um, you know, 899 pages later ended up being a short story of 15 pages. <laughs> and he hated that. Even though he loved the story, it was his first thing published. He didn't include it in his collective, Richard Bausch, because he just hated the entire process of that. Um, so luckily, that hasn't happened to me yet. And I hope it doesn't, actually. <laughs> I, I suppose, actually, the um, level of work I'm now, there was a, I just, again, wrote some ideas down. And I didn't know what it would end up being. And it's really changed a lot since that first initial scribble. Um, but it, I suppose that idea could have turned into a short story. Um, but it didn't. Obviously, you've written short stories and novels as well as writing journalistically. Are there any forms that you haven't written yet that you would like to maybe in the future? Hmm. I don't know. Have you written the odd poem? Not that I'm ever going to admit that to the poets in the audience. Um, such as? I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, genres left would be a play. I even did, in graduate school, I made a point of, I took a playwriting class, in part because I'd had this um, instructor as an undergraduate, and he was so marvelous. I just wanted to um, take a class with him again. So those are just little scenes. Um, that would be cool, but I don't see myself trying. So maybe I don't want to that much. <laughs> well, um, one one sort of last last move, as it were. Um, I, I I love the way in uh, I've got the title, the one I will. You suddenly turn to the reader who who at least in my case, suddenly jumps back when you say, but you want me to come to my point, don't you? To the culmination of my story. And I plead guilty. I, I want to know what's going to happen. Um, so you, you have, a, I think, a, a strong sense of, of your readers. What would you like to tell your readers uh, uh, before we finish? <laughs> that story is so completely different from all the others that I was almost worried about including it because it has a, such a different tone and voice. And, and yet I remember being having such fun writing that. I remember just, just having a blast, like just sort of trying to flip things around again and again and again, really quite consciously doing that. Um, so I think I'm trying to avoid this, this question. I'm not, I'm not sure what I want to tell my readers, except you know, or, yeah, so, or more talk. generally, is there anything you'd like to t tell the audience tonight oh, so, um, by way of conclusion? Gosh, I don't know. There's so many of my lovely students here. Um, and I guess I'd want to say, don't hesitate. Don't hold back. Just go for everything. You know, just write a lot. And don't worry about whether it's good enough. Just do it and have fun. Okay, thank you very much.